our keynote speaker. Thank you very much, Doctor. I can sit down, but uh, uh, reading this will not be easy, but that's okay. When I feel a little bit of pressure on my leg, I'll take a break. Don't worry, madam. Thank you very much. It should be okay. The, the vice chancellor, most ably represented by my own sister, my colleague, my collaborator, and someone we are running after. We've been doing this now for like three decades. Professor Bolanle Akare Doluale, who is also Dublin as a DVC academic of this university. You see why we are running after her. We've not been able to produce a didn't talk less of a DVC. So we'll continue to run. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> no, on paper, you got the institute before us. Uh, on paper. <laughs> Principal officers of this university, my very good friend, the Dean Komla Rod, Professor Fakoya. Yeah. Uh, my HOD and my friend of many, many, many years. And let me say this now, as the Vice Chancellor has said in his opening remark, if you have not read a book in philosophy, don't count yourself as educated. Is the philosopher in the house and someone whose equity we deeply respect? The convener. She's all over the place. I can understand why. Please, 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 please. I'm just acknowledging you. Very well done, ma, for putting this together for us. For me, FUNAB is home. Uh, I've been here over and over and over and over. We continue to work together. We continue to march on together. And that is why it's home. So coming here is not, I'm doing nobody a favor by coming here. I'm only doing myself a favor and doing my university a favor as well. We regard FUNAB as a leader in Nigeria. And by extension, because you claim it, leader in Africa. So, I, I'm really happy, I'm honored to be here with you. Who's con is a movement. And I believe that movement is being led again by FUNAB. And I pray it becomes a huge success. And they are raising a deeply topical 
issue of international importance. Many of us see this issue as a contestation of space between humanities and the sciences. But it is a lot more than that, as I'm going to show. It is not just between humanities and the sciences. It is about saving the soul of humanity. And many, many, many scores and dozens of scientists don't know this. We deeply respect what they are doing. Professor Fakoya, we do respect what you are doing as scientists. But we want that that progress that science is making has a human face. Today, the world faces dire consequences from the progress being made by science. And that is why this conference is timely. The issue is topical. And so many people are passionate about the matter. Not just us here. So humanizing science and humanizing technology evinces critical discourse that is going on right now as we speak on a daily basis all over the world. Not just here. We are a part of that international discourse. We are contributing a little bit to the direction. So, I thank the organizers of this conference for raising one of the biggest issues of this century. What does humanizing mean? Professor Kafakoya has given some definitions of humanizing. What humanizing really means. One is to make something more humane, more civilized. It is not to stop science from marching forward, but to make it more humane, more civilized. To many of us in this climate, we believe that when we talk about science, we are talking about science. Indeed, that is correct. Because without science, we will not have the kind of civilization that we are in today. But that civilization can be more civilized, can be more humane. And we'll see the implications of this as we go on. Two is to give something a human character. That has a lot of implications. Again, we'll see as we move on. Are we becoming human? This is the progression of humanity from the early days. Charles Darwin's evolutionary science has traced the development of man until we started wielding the first pieces of technology and advanced on and on 
until the discovery of the computer, programmed computer. And from the program computer, what do we now have? Something looking like a human, but a little bit not quite human. It is what they then call today humanoid. Having the characteristics of a human, but, and a big but, where would that lead us? We'll see. Now, what does humanizing mean? Take a moment to look at the picture on the left. You can interpret that picture in several ways. And whichever way you interpret it, you would be correct. But some context of use in the discourse, international discourse on humanizing. One, joyful to use, to create technology with, which goes beyond pure functionality to create pleasurable interaction. Two, making technology trustworthy, accessible, to educate human users by explaining complex systems to help foster trust in those systems. Reading human factors to make technology better, able to interpret and react to human factors, such as recognizing the emotions of users. Uh, be, before going on to the next slide, I titled this Humanizing SciTech. I didn't say science because the use of SciTech itself has some implication, which we will explain later. As time went on, science and technology in the universities were at each other's throat. Technology started seeing science as becoming irrelevant. And they believe that technology is the be all in the world. So that's why I use SciTech, because in this context, we are talking about both science and technology. Then we continue with what humanizing means. Ethics in the algorithm to design AIs, we started getting used to that term and concept some two, three decades ago. Everybody started talking about AIs. And of course, its partner, robots. To design AIs and algorithms which conform to ethical and political intuitions. Human-like behavior to create AIs and robots which can at most convince, can pass as a human, or at least act and appear convincingly human. And six, human-like intelligence to work towards developing AIs with human level or human-like general intelligence. So what is science? It is defined by Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary as knowledge about the structure and behavior of the natural and physical world based on facts that you can prove 
for example, by experiments. And who is a scientist? Whoever is engaged in the construction of knowledge about structure and behavior of the natural world. And so stricto sensu, man in all societies is a scientist. Man in all societies is a scientist. They may not all claim to be scientists professionally, but that's how we've come to where we are today. This is the condition for his survival. Because without science, from the rudimentary stage of life till where we are, we would not have survived. The elements would not have allowed us to survive. For the elaboration of culture and transmission of knowledge and culture to new generations. I took that from Olorode and Ilo, late Ilo. Scientific knowledge, therefore, pre-modern times, there are universals and there are particularities. Everywhere in the world, as we already said, there are scientists. People practice science. Our culture is loaded with a lot of scientific discoveries. Our art, even our art. There was a, a clip, video clip that was making the rounds a couple of years ago till now with scientists now trying to understand how the pyramids of Egypt were built. And that it is unimaginable. Even for engineers of today to embark on building such scientifically enormous edifice. When they made the calculations and the placement and the materials and everything, they, they still keep wondering how those pyramids were built. So, we are talking about pyramids built how many centuries ago? And today, they are scientific wonders. So there are universes all over, and there are particularities. E.g., I bought the inaugural lecture of retired Professor Lunge of UI. Professor, I think they call him the first professor of computer science, either in Nigeria or in Africa. That inaugural lecture detail how the Ifa divination using the binary system is a precursor of the binary mathematics that is built into the computer of today. So can you imagine that? The Ifa divination preceded So counting systems around the world, all of these are tagged as scientific knowledge and they, they exist everywhere. Can you see me there? Let them go. Let them go. Let them go. Let them go. Oh. 
for me. Okay. Please for the second one. Which is Abi Yes. Aha. So, if sci-tech, science and technology are all those things we, we have said, how did the relations get sour? So, the point today, we are talking about the sour relationship between the sciences and the humanities between science and technology, between science, technology, and humanity. Science versus humanities, or the liberal arts. And this is all over the world, it's not just Nigeria. Don't forget what we said earlier. There are universes and there are particularities. Even in the US, the most scientifically advanced country in the world, there are disagreements between science and the liberal arts. Between science and technology. There are disagreements between pure science and applied science, and between science techno and technology and humanity. This is the US STEM search between 2011 and 2017, the data from the National Center for Education Statistics Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System. History dropped 31 points. Religion, 27. Languages, 22. English, 22. Political Science, 15. Anthropology, 14. Sociology, 6. Arts, 5. Art history didn't drop but there are very few people doing that anyway. Music gained two points. Business four, cultural, ethnic, and gender studies five. Psychology 16, chemistry 24, biology 31, physics 36, engineering 49. Nursing 66. No wonder all the nurses in Nigeria have migrated. They are brain drained and medical doctors. Computer science, 67. Believe it or not, exercise science, 74. The growth of exercise science should not alarm anyone. Again, on account of what science and technology had done, more and more people needed exercise and they needed to be guided. Obesity, diabetes, and all manner of ailments are crept in. Because for instance, in the US, they won't offer you water, they will offer you a soda. And what's a soda? A pack of sugar. In a small bottle, several cubes of sugar packed into it. And you see small kids as big as this, even before they are 10. And all of those things now require exercises to correct and medication. So don't be surprised. This is the way it is in the United States, the particularity of 
the advancement of science and technology. And let's contextualize this, this whole discussion in history and philosophy. My philosophy teacher has uh, stood up. Better for me, so I can say a whole lot of things without. Oh, okay, keep quiet wherever you are. <laughs> so, the view of science tech as a tool. 16th, 17th century, Descartes, Bacon, believe science technology will enable man have dominion over nature. That is the knowledge is power that we all say. It's become a mantra. Knowledge is power. Yet the most knowledgeable are subjects of the buffoons. They are directed and commanded and ruled over by buffoons. So, where is the knowledge is power thing that we talk about? 18th century enlightenment thinkers, liberating power of knowledge to free man from darkness and ignorance. That was their view. Man because becomes autonomous, rational, free. So when you hear Americans talking about, it is my right, we are a free society. And the new president of the US has told them now it's freedom to die. Because they refuse to be vaccinated. They refuse to wear the masks to protect themselves from public health pandemic. The freedom, the seed of freedom was sowed then and it had continued. 19th century, the second half, Karl Marx came and identified the pervis perverseness of integration of side tech into productive forces in service of capital. So when we talk about capitalism, 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 it's about capital. And everybody wants you to believe that if you have capital, you become a superman, the freest man in the world. Does it work? What it has done is to subject the vast majority of people to those who own capital. The richest men in the world today are side tech people, especially digital technology, or those who leverage digital technology to build their empires. Jeff Bezos, Two weeks ago, or thereabout, two, three weeks ago, flew into space just a few miles outside of planet Earth. Didn't get into real space like NASA did. Richard Branson, another billionaire. All of them who had built capital and are using science and technology to build their empires. And people are celebrating them as billionaires. In the same country, Richard Branson comes from the UK. Hardly pays tax in the UK. Millions of children go hungry in the UK that seen a footballer, a young footballer, it, no, Rashford is no longer a teenager, I guess. He's 20 something, I think. Raising funds to feed children. For Richard Branson is flying to orbit for entertainment. 
that is what capital is doing. And this is what we are talking about. So, Karl Marx identified this perverse And then post World War II, Adorno, a disciple of Karl Marx, of the Frankfurt School of uh, Marxism, saw ambiguity in the power of SciTech in the objectivization, goods fetishism. And that's what we've, they've got us into now. Uh, which year was it? Virtually every year, anyway. You get into the advanced countries. Apple comes out with a new iPhone. Samsung comes out with a new one. And when it's to be released, people keep vigils. They got one last year, but they want the newest one. Madness. Just because they can afford it. And some who cannot afford it live in debt. That's fetishism. Uh, the bewitching power of technology. So in 1950s, Heidegger, another German philosopher, painted a more gory picture. Man is totally dominated and becomes a tool of the devious side tech. That's own view. He developed that idea much further. I can't go into all of that right now, unfortunately. I'll leave that to my philosophers. He's listening to me, watching me now. He thinks I'm going to sleep somewhere. We'll meet after, after this. You can do all the corrections you want. And this is the big paradox of SciTech. Enormous potentials of being a faithful tool of humanity. Enormous potentials. Just before we were called to the table, I just received a message on my email about the wonder that China has done within less than 50 years. China is the only country in the world that has lifted more than 50 million people out of poverty. 50 years ago, the 1.4 billion people of China, more than 90% were living in squalor. Not so today. America, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, they are looking for Chinese students who bring lots of money into their economy. Where did that all come from? Sensible use of SciTech. Controlled use of SciTech. COVID-19 pandemic started in China, Wuhan. today's best controlled within China. Occasional outbreaks, but quickly controlled. The U.S. lost over 600,000 citizens and they still don't care. They are not going to be vaccinated. They will not use the mask. They don't want to be controlled. You want, you want to take away our freedom. Freedom to die. Freedom to go into extinction. So, huge contributions of science technology to modern society. As I said, without SciTech, where would we be? We are here. The temperatures are rising, but we have all these funds. We have the light. We have the environment. And we can live. We have all of these. People who are attending this conference, not here. All of these things, 
were enabled or and still are being enabled by science and technology. So we are not saying science and technology is evil. We are saying we need to watch the use of science and technology for evil by capital. You want a good research grant today. If you are going to research into something that somebody needs, they'll pump money into it. We are all scrambling to apply for the funds and to carry out that research, not minding where that research will lead to. The man who discovered dynamite didn't know it was going to be used. Lori, who discovered nuclear fusion, didn't know that America was going to use it to destroy Nagasaki. Japan is still doing the anniversary of destruction, 1945, today. So we do this research not knowing where it's going, not knowing the intentions of those who are funding the research. Of course, they will never tell you they are going to use it this way. But for as long as it brings in money for them, allows them to build an empire so they can go and have a holiday in the space. It's all well and good. And this is what we are talking about. So, so all of the usefulness of SciTech versus irreversible. They've just had another conference on climate. And they have agreed now that one, some of the greatest damage that has been done is irreversible. Fires are raging in the west of America and southern uh, Europe. Greece's islands are going up in flames. Turkey witnessed the same. Water swept through Germany, Belgium, and where? And destroyed so much. At such countries, if those, a percentage of that happened in Nigeria, where would we be? This is what we are talking about. But all of these have been brought about by industrial revolution. 18th, 19th century industrial revolution that was kicked off. We are the least contributors to, uh, to pollution, to the zone layer depletion. But it doesn't mean we are not going to reap the fruits of the evil that was done by those people. And then DNA sequencing, human cloning. Where is that leading us? Designer babies. Rich people are now selecting, I want the nose of my baby to be this, I want the hair to be this, and so on. And then, I want that baby to be super intelligent. But what would they use that intelligence to do? We do not know. And we don't ask. Professor Fakoya, GMOs. I hear some scientists are even promoting that in Nigeria. Not only in Nigeria, even in Africa. But we don't know where it's going to lead us. That is the problem. And some organizations have taken Monsanto to court and are taking billions from Monsanto. One of the organizations promoting GMO. Some of the realities are this. I already spoke about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
humanoids with feeling, thinking, and intelligence. Humanoids, not humans. Privacy and surveillance, which somebody has called surveillance capitalism. As we are here now, yes, we are streaming this conference to the rest of the world. But we are locked in with devices. We are making use of applications. And we are all registered. And they have our data. And they can do whatever they like with our data. When they tell you, we are not going to know this is ethical something, we are not. But they will sell your data to those who don't believe in any ethics to make money. That is the world in which we are today. The big five, big boys of data, Amazon, Jeff Bezos, Google, with a parent company called Alphabet. Who doesn't use Google here? Even if you don't buy things on Amazon, who doesn't use Google? If you use a smartphone, you are using Google. Google has everything about you. They even follow you wherever you go. I think once, any, once a month or once a week, they tell me where all the places I've been to. <laughs> so if I think I want to hide, I can hide. Microsoft, Apple, Facebook. That young man has become so powerful in the world. So, I mean, I mean, so powerful. Social media for political propaganda and manipulation. Fake news. Ordinary fake. Deep fake. To create you using hologram doing things you would never imagine of doing. And everybody who sees it will believe it. They have also coined this one, Algo Crazy. From algorithm that has gone crazy. Weapons of mass destruction. So we see where mathematics is being used. We see what digital technology is being used for. These are all the things. Now, HRI, human robot interaction. Care robots, beautiful. Some of us have our aged parents who are not very well. And you can use a robot to care for them. Feed them, take, clean them up, take them on walk, and bring them back home. But you never know what that robot can do. And they've gone beyond that. Sex robots. So you wonder why there is declining, declining population in Europe and the Americas. Japan is in crisis. What has surfaced in Japan today is that they have a population of aged people and not enough young people to work, care for them. Young people in Japan are no longer getting married. They are not even having relationships. Talk to many young people in Japan about marriage. They say, what's so cool? It's about career. They are building careers. But they forget that they must have a population of young people in work to cater for those who are now old, made possible by the advancements in medicine. They now live longer. But you need young people who can work to provide for them. So these are things we are talking about. 
Some people don't like, oh, no, uh, uh, your boyfriend, girlfriend, what's so called? I can't stick, I can't stick. They, they, they are troublesome. Boys are too troublesome. I don't want them. So what do you want? They get a robot. What's the impact of that on population? China, because they were growing at an alarming rate, decided they were going to, and they decreed. One family, one child. They've suddenly reversed it. So these are consequences. And as I say, they have coined, also coined the term law of unintended consequences. What we are witnessing are a result of unintended, in many cases, consequences. Automation and employment. Many of us will be out of job very soon. Any work that is repetitive, robots will do them. And you are out of job. And that's it. So everybody has to be creative one way or the other to remain alive. That's what it means to remain alive. You have to be creative. Autonomous systems. We never imagined this as well. Autonomous vehicles. We've seen them in video clips. We've seen them on television. Autonomous. You don't need a driver. Call one, sit at the back, and it drives you to wherever you want to go. Now, think about this. If there is an accident, who do you hold responsible? The passenger or the robot that is driving him. <laughs> or the inventor. There are consequences. We are not talking about those consequences yet. That's simple to deal with. Autonomous weapons. So I create an autonomous weapon that can launch nu nuclear war warhead and then target a population. And when it strikes, destroys everybody there, who do you hold responsible for that? You think you are safe. You are running away. You are hiding. Google will pinpoint where you are. The autonomous weapon will find you out and kill you there. These are unintended, what did I call it? Consequences. That's science and technology. I got all of this from Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, 2020. The international dimension of factors of all of these. How did they come about? Rise of the middle class. Renaissance, enlightenment, and the laissez-faire liberal spirit, which gave rise to individualism. That's libra, individualism. Economic laissez-faire. Industrial revolution that brought changing social structures. and factors of production which brought new social relations. New hegemonic science tech culture emerged, pushing consumerism. Everything is about consumption now, not very much more about production. And Nigeria is a good dumping ground for all of these. We have become very fetish for the products of technology. But we are not alone. It's all over the world. So then the local factors, colonialism and imperialism that have made Nigeria a dumping ground. Indolent political elite following colonial education policies 
remember, colonialists wanted education in, in Nigeria and all of their colonies. But it was secretarial education. In other words, interpreters, note takers, civil servants, never emphasized science. And when we got up to science, we thought science was going to be everything for us. I remember in 1982, our very first set of students, you know, Futa, Funab, we all started out at the same time. And one of our students said, oh, we are going to be the saviors of this country. I asked them in class then, how do you believe you are going to be able to do all of this? Oh, don't worry, sir. you read Acts. Just go on. We are going to transform Nigeria. I said, I wish you the best of luck. Since graduation in 1987, one of them has been a teacher and still a teacher till today. So in those years past, when we get talking, I say, uh-uh. I see how you have transformed Nigeria. I say, don't mind those people. I say, which? <laughs> so, we thought science was going to be the liberator. And then, his master's voice from abroad. All we were producing were primary products. And shipping, that's even uh, what we call crude oil. We still sell crude oil. We can't even refine the one we put in our vehicles, in our generators. We cannot. We then go back there to go and buy refined, and we sell at exorbitant prices to our own people. That is his master's voice by indolent political elite. And that's where we, are, we still are today. A peripheral capitalist state. Then they came with the 6040. 60 science, technology, and 40 liberal arts, humanities. And we asked them, what are you going to do? Just like my student I spoke about. So yeah, we need them to transform Nigeria. They finish school now. Five, six, seven, eight years, they can get a job. So, And then they came, when all of that didn't work, they said every university must start an, entrepreneur, an entrepreneurship center where they learn how to, how to make ropes, how to sew, how to do this, how to do that. With no enabling environment to enable them use this, we they have developed over four or five years in the university to transform those things into greater things. But they, they were looking for shortcuts. Our political elite are always looking for shortcuts. If everybody was an entrepreneur, yes, if everybody was selling a car, who would buy? You sell your car to me, I sell my car to you. <laughs> okay. So this is where Locally, this has led us. And now we know that we need new relationships. Science, humanities, we need new relationships. New ethics. New values. Of course, we all say it. Our value system has been destroyed. Yes, they have. But we can get back to the old ones wholesale. We need new ones founded on the values of the old. Because the values of the old were based on a humanity. I'm here because you enable to be here. 
And I don't get here and say, you are no longer important. Everyone lives because of is not we are going to destroy planet Earth and I'm going to fly off into space and live there. That is not how it works. They will make sure you don't last. They will don't they will make sure your your spacecraft does not leave the planet Earth. It will burn here. So Collaboration of science, tech, and humanities. This is what we are talking about. We need collaboration. We need cooperation. We need a redeeming ethics. Not of nihilism, not of hedonism. Nihilism is destroy everything. Nothing is worth it. Nothing makes any sense. Just let, and that's the kind of value uh, young people of today have. It's never going to work. Let's just destroy it. No. Nobody builds a society, a community on those values. Not hedonism either. Because everything should not be about pleasure. If everything is about pleasure, then nothing will be worth it. We need the values of the Zulu word Ubuntu. Ubuntu. That has taken a new philosophical dimension around the world today. Ubuntu. It's love, peace, happiness. But you are not going to achieve that by saying it. It's the essence of being human. African philosophy emphasizing being self through others. Because of who we all are. There are, this has been defined so many ways, but the essence of it is that of community spirit, which we used to have. We, the West, has thrown away because of individualism. It's me, 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 my freedom, regardless of my community. Not our freedom, but my freedom, my right, not our right. That gets us nowhere. That is to destroy the world. Who is going to be left behind if the world was destroyed? And where are we going to be going when we live here? We need planet Earth. We need humanity. Let's work together. Scientists, artists, humanists, let's work together to build the world that we inherited. Do not let us destroy it. Thank you very much for your attention.